Hi. So I have, uh, first of all, I have no affiliation with any Oklahoma entity. I just happen to like the state. I'm a big fan of both the University of Oklahoma in Norman, beautiful campus, as well as Oklahoma State, which of course has Coach Smith's wrestling team. I have no affiliation with the Oklahoma City Police Department. Uh, it, Oklahoma City has one of the best museums in the whole world, dedicated to the Oklahoma City bombing that was perpetuated by McVeigh and I believe another person. Um, so today we're going to talk about why poor people are a security risk. And poor people are, in a nutshell, a security risk because they increase the chances that a city's or any government's, whether national, state, or local, they increase the chances that security spending will be at some point imbalanced in the future. And what do I mean by that? So right now, we know that most of the wealth in America, at least in, on an individual level, is through housing and inflation. In other words, most Americans don't have that much cash on hand. Uh, almost all the value that they have in terms of wealth, net wealth, would be in the form of housing. And you, know, you can study the mortgage interest tax deduction, which, you know, just figure out how much that costs the federal government every year. It's substantial. And when you put it all together, what you're really looking at is an economy that does not necessarily prioritize consumer wealth, but housing wealth, because housing wealth is tied to banking debt. And of course, the government makes money as well. Uh, you've got you know, Fannie Mae, Ginny Mae, a host of government entities that are supposed to be regulating the banks involved in these transactions. But as we saw in 2008, 2009, whether it was Moody's, a credit rating agency, uh, or Fannie Mae or Ginny Mae, you essentially had regulators asleep at the wheel. Now, why is that important? It's important because you realize that much of the wealth in America is simply a combination of whether of, well, of private and public investment and whether or not banks and politicians decided to inject loans, especially mortgage mortgages into your neighborhood and especially jumbo mortgages. And absent that assistance, there's a good chance that the economy in your neighborhood has, will have difficulty growing. And as a result, the people within those neighborhoods will probably turn to the informal economy. And the informal economy always reminds me that term of Hernando de Soto, and he's essentially the best economist of our generation, if you consider sociology to be part of economics. And the whole idea here is that the poor are not really poor. The poor simply don't have the same level of government support as others in the formal above ground economy. I believe the, the best quote that I can think of is that in developed countries, the problem is that you've got paperless assets that are propping up the rich and you've got, wait, paperless assets? No, you've got, I've got it the other way around. The poor are subjected to paperless assets. In other words, assets that are worth money, but are outside formal registration, thereby making it difficult to transfer it thereby making it impossible to have any sort of inheritance or multi-generational wealth. So you've got paperless assets that are holding back the poor, who again are not really poor, they're simply underserved. And then you've got assetless paper. In other words, derivatives, you know, sort of made up financial instruments that are simply reflections of underlying assets, but, them, but, they, but that themselves do not necessarily add any value 
the fascination with NFTs today is an example of that phenomenon that continues to essentially multiply the debt that is a part of registered assets within formal economies in a way that doesn't necessarily improve society. So when you look at it in that sense, what you're really looking at is this idea uh, that if you have an imbalanced economy, you're going to eventually have imbalanced security spending that will threaten the fabric of your society by tearing apart social cohesion. And when you look at it that way, you can also see why so much of the economy in neighborhoods that have been underserved by formal actors, in this case, banks, lawyers, and politicians, you look at it, you know, what, what's happening in those neighborhoods is an economy, just not one that's recognized by the formal economy and by formal actors. And by that, I mean, you've got drugs, you've got a lot of money going through the drug trade, you have a lot of money going through any sort of quote unquote, illicit activity, especially in terms of undeclared services. And that would include anything from having your hair cut in somebody else's house without a license or a permit, and of course, without taxation, all the way up to simply selling maybe even, you know, prescription drugs, you know, that are received through either Medicaid or some other program on the, on the street. Now, you can see right away that, you know, you have a type of formal economy, especially where welfare benefits are involved, but it's the kind of economy that makes people in those neighborhoods subject and dependent on the formal economy whether through direct welfare pro programs such as Medicaid, Medi-Cal, a state program, and so on, or whether through an indirect negligence or w what we could call a lack of oversight. And we know this because, uh, you know, we know that somebody, everybody from Malcolm X to James Lipton, I believe he was the host of Inside the Actor's Studio, to even, I, I learned this yesterday, to even to um, the author of Mark Twain, no, no, sorry, I, I can't believe, oh, sorry, William Faulkner, I, I, I apologize, I confused some names there. So all these men of diverse backgrounds at one point were managing brothels and were serving as a kind of pimp. And in that, it's, it's really, it really is shocking, by the way, right? But you look at these three men, all of whom are from different backgrounds, but all of whom were sucked into the informal sector. And then this starts to make a little bit more sense. Now, my, my evidence for Faulkner uh, is an interview in the Paris Review, uh, where he talks about you know, just he has, he's got a f fantastic quote. He says that, you know, I don't believe in working eight hours a day. You know, you can't make love for eight hours a day. You can't do anything for eight hours a day straight except for work. And so I don't think that mankind's natural state is to be a cog in this capitalist. Well, he just didn't say it like that, right? He just said that, you know, and it's a very typical Southern manner. He didn't use sort of political terms. He simply said that, you know, there has to be more than more to life than working eight hours a day because the natural state of mankind is that you can't do anything for eight hours a day. And so we're tr sort of trying to squeeze ourselves and our souls into, you know, these square pegs that don't really maximize potential. And in the course of that discussion, which I heavily paraphrased, he was saying that, you know, ultimately the best job I ever had was managing a brothel. You know, you simply, you got to know all the police officers by their first names because you had to pay them off every week. So you had a, you know, Malcolm X did the same thing because Malcolm X was also a, at one point in time, uh, a pimp that was connected to his prior activity, which was running numbers, basically taking money proceeds from gambling and, you know, taking them, you know, transporting them across to
you know, whoever was in charge of managing the money. And as a teenager, Malcolm X would be, you know, less likely to be stopped by the police. Um, so you have, you know, all these different things here and you start to see how the informal economy is actually a very large portion of the economy. It's simply not registered. And it has to be a large accepted portion of the economy to the extent that you've got so many people from so many different backgrounds all over the country basically saying that, yeah, we paid police officers. This was part of our, you know, weekly ritual. Everyone's basically in on it. And so the other issue is that, of course, by not investing equally or equitably in your country's economy and in your country's neighborhoods, you also run the risk of having corrupt police departments. Because inevitably what happens is that people are going to participate in illicit activities regardless of police involvement or lack of involvement. And as a result, it becomes just like any other business. It's simply handled differently. So when we put all these things in context, we start to realize overall that we're dealing with a multifaceted economy that few economists really understand. And if you see it that way, if you look at the potential for corruption, especially on the vice side of police departments, and simply just again, the idea of imbalanced security spending as a result of underinvestment, you again have this idea that the poor become a security risk simply because you're creating a situation where you expect one side of your city to smile while the other side is being pinched. You know, in other words, you, you expect a situation of a tale of two cities that never ever are expected to come together. And that's why we have so much segregation, which is also a type of security risk. But all these things hopefully make sense. Now, before you get on, on your high horse and you talk about how the formal economy, of course, is superior to the informal economy for many reasons. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with having government support for housing, which ties res residents to their communities. Uh, there's nothing wrong with any of this and which allows, you know, some sort of sustainable development, assuming population growth is maintained. There's nothing wrong with, with that structure, you might say. And you have to really understand that, you know, when you go outside, what do you see? You go outside in any city center, you're going to see a bar, you're going to see a Starbucks, and you'll probably see a pharmacy. And what do all those represent? Well, Starbucks is caffeine, that's a drug. You know, you go into a grocery store, you see a Coca-Cola, that's sugar. And of course, caffeine, you go into your pharmacy and that's drugs. One of the documentaries I saw on the drug trade had a drug abuser say in the documentary that the best drug dealer I ever had was my pharmacist. So you go back, you look at the bars, what is that? Alcohol, that's a drug, it used to be banned. And you, you look at the legal structures around all these different things, right? To, to open a bar you need a, or even a liquor store, you have to have a license. You probably have to have a license from multiple you know, departments. And you can see how this is something that perpetuates sort of a top-down governance. And especially in the case of liquor licenses, you can see how limited supply would also, in a sense, create advantages for people that know police or that are familiar with local procedures in a way that outsiders might not be. Which of course then maintains this schism and divide between the formal economy and the informal economy, which then leads to, or excuse me, which then increases the chances of the risk of corruption and segregation, which together form a security risk for everyone involved. So you might ask, well, what about, you know, well, again, 
I guess the counter argument to what I just said might be that, well, actually, if you look at, you know, the places that have the most jumbo loans on mortgages, in, in most cases, they are tied in some way to technology. Okay, that's, that's probably true. I'm in San Jose, uh, Silicon Valley. We don't really make silicon wafers anymore, but you know, that's beside the point. Well, what's the spending here? That's security spending, right? That's surveillance. A lot of the technology here is, has been invented and has prospered as a result of an alliance between the federal government, security agencies, and private technology companies. And there's a book called, I believe it's either called Surveillance Capitalism or The Surveillance Economy. So again, we're talking about a type of predestined economy, economic structure that favors some neighborhoods over others and so on and so forth. I suppose I'm trying to think of other counter arguments, but let's talk about how we can do things differently. Now you look at Singapore, Singapore, because it had, it took over from the British, you know, had an issue with criminals and, you know, ultimately stamped them all out and in doing so stamped out the drug trade in Singapore, thereby giving the former government a lot of credibility, which it then used to, you know, gather investment in the formal economy, which then made it, or has made it, perhaps the most successful country in the whole world. Now, Singapore, of course, is quite small. It is able, was able to do that because it was able to stamp out essentially the mafia and the Chinese triads because ultimately, once the British colonizers left, you had a situation, or the British protectorate left, you had a situation where there wasn't really any need to have, you know, a situation where you had segregation because the country was quite small. The small size allowed the country also to have a viable and credible security presence. And as a result, it was able to swap out illicit investment and illicit economic factors for formal economic factors. And therefore, it's not a coincidence that having done that, it is now perhaps the world leader in finance. It cleaned up the drug trade and it moved into the formal economy. It attracted investment. Now, can everybody do this? No. Uh, Singapore, of course, only has one border. And, you know, it shares that border with Malaysia and, you know, just one country. Uh, it's, you know, again, in a situation where it is a, it has access to a crucial port that has always been crucial throughout history called the Straits of Malacca. Now we have issues with the South China Sea uh, because it's such an important shipping route. So you have some ways of getting around this potential security risk. But the real question is, how do you do it when you're not a small country? And when you have a government that's not dedicated to stamping out corruption in order to maximize its credibility. And, and in Singapore's case, it's survival. In other words, it had to get rid of the criminals uh, in order to essentially attract formal investment. And had it not attracted formal investment when the British left, the country would not exist, at least not in the form that we see today. And this is, of course, you know, important because you, you hear about the opium wars. You know, Singapore was a quote-unquote free port. That doesn't mean it didn't charge fees, but ultimately it was also a shipping route for drugs. And again, we see how this economic history has resulted in this idea of economic regulation in order to stamp out the criminal sector in order to attract formal investment. But in the United States, because the country is so large, because you have so many different economic actors and so many different levels of government, it's the battle against drugs, which is really a battle against the criminal sector, has failed. And the question is, and not only has it failed, it's resulted in corruption in many police departments. And so the question becomes, you know, as, as well as segregation. So the question becomes, what does a country like America do when it is faced with this problem. And I think that's the question we have to think about. And if, if I'm right, that the, poor, that the poor are a security risk, 
then one avenue to eventual reform has to be this idea of the government asserting credibility through economic investment in underserved areas. That's going to require not just grants, not just community-based organizations, but cooperation with the police. And cooperation in a way that allows the police to become, to work side by side with lawyers and, and other branches of government in order to assert themselves in a way that takes people away from the informal economy and into the formal economy. There is no blueprint for doing that in such a big country that's faced with segregation and that has had segregation in so many different ways, you know, did, you know, both in law and in fact for so long. And that is the question that politicians and police officers ought to be thinking about. As long as they understand that the poor are a security risk as well as a corruption risk.